To go over the points made in Dr. Pania's interview in my previous video, he began by saying that millions of people have gone through death beyond the post-mortem period and come back to life due to the fact that the cells in your body go into a hibernation state for hours of time, and during that period you can be brought back to life. Which is why the experiences that people have are truly reflecting the experience of death, not just near death, and people who go through death and return have universal, consistent experiences that are cross-cultural, cross-religious, and shared by non-religious people as well. This alone makes it surprising for mainstream science to not only ignore such a phenomenon, but go so far as to deny its relevance. As we have already discussed, this tendency of refusing to acknowledge certain truths, that is the fact that there are so many reports of consciousness prevailing after the death of the body, that can be substantiated by practicing doctors, correlates with the left hemisphere becoming somewhat stuck described by Ian McGilchrist as a form of stickiness and a tendency to recur to what it is familiar with, reinforcing whatever it is already doing in order to discover more of what it already knows. A prime example of this actually being demonstrated by a well-known spokesman of science is that he remarked that consciousness beyond death can't be possible, because if it is, it would give credence to the existence of God, and that needs to be avoided. The next point worth mentioning is that Dr. Sam Parnia, a British Associate Professor of Medicine at NYU Langone Medical Center and Director of Research into Cardiopulmonary Disease, never intended to begin research into death or scientifically pass through and beyond death. However, that's exactly what science is now doing. He finds that when people undergo this transition, they have lucid experiences of death that are not consistent with hallucinations, illusions, or delusions. These are real experiences that are occurring. Our consciousness itself is remarkable. Dr. Pania exclaims, we have things that other animals can't do. We can recite poetry and write and appreciate music. We can go to the moon and to Mars. We can cure COVID. And we can tackle even what happens when we die. So our consciousness is quite unique. And I think it's a little bit of a disservice to think that it is simply some sort of byproduct of the brain, a little bit like heat coming off of a fire, which really oversimplifies what is remarkable about human consciousness. I think the scientific answer that many of us are veering towards is that consciousness, the things that make us who we are, is a separate, undiscovered scientific entity that interacts with the brain in the same way that you need a radio or a TV to decode electromagnetic waves and turn them into sound and picture. But they're not produced by the TV or the radio, and it might be that consciousness is a separate, undiscovered entity that is remarkable and can do all these remarkable things. And that might be a better explanation. This next point that Dr. Pania makes answers the question that we as well as a certain scientific spokesperson, have asked regarding why we have no recollection of any sort of conscious existence before we are born. What's remarkable is that science has gone through and gone beyond the boundaries of death, and we're exploring what happens to people in that state. What I think is really happening, which is truly remarkable to me, is that as one goes through death, their brain is shutting down. And normally the parts of their brain that are acting like braking systems are acting like an inhibition process that allows them to do what they need to do in their day-to-day -day life. Those things that are prominent disappear. There's what's called the process of disinhibition. Those things go away. And then, remarkably, they get access to their entire consciousness. Everything they've done, everything that they've said. Everything that they've intended is remembered, and then they start to analyze themselves based upon morality and ethics. So it really is truly remarkable what is going on when you're going into death, and I think that is something that we're trying to explore further. Dr. Sampania makes a distinction between truly reflecting the experience of death and near-death experiences. However, there isn't a real difference between the two. If one dies and is dead for an extended period before being resuscitated, it could still be described as near death because death was ultimately averted. 
The reason I wish to point out the similarity between these two descriptions is because now we will look into this phenomenon of consciousness prevailing after death by another source, whose research aligns with Dr. Parnia to the extent we have discussed, but goes further in reporting on the actual experiences these people have, and his work and website use the term near-death experience. This alternative source is Dr. Jeffrey Long, from the Near-Death Experience Foundation website. Near-Death Experience Foundation Survey Methodology Minimizing the Risk of Falsified Accounts How are NDEs shared with the Near-Death Experience Foundation assessed for reliability? Could some be false? 1. The Near-Death Experience Foundation survey is very long, with over 150 questions that require a response before the survey can be submitted. The survey length is a substantial disincentive to filling it out falsely as a joke. 2. Those who take the Near-Death Experience Foundation survey receive no payment of any kind. 3. Experiences are posted anonymously. There is no personal recognition to incentivize sharing false accounts. 4. In the 16-year history of the Near-Death Experience Foundation, we have had exactly one person contact us to let us know that they shared a falsified account and that we posted it. 5. The fact that the Near-Death Experience Foundation website has 60,000 to 70,000 unique visitors a month from all around the world greatly reduces the risk that any accounts posted are plagiarized. With so many readers, any plagiarized account would likely be recognized by Near-Death Experience Foundation readers and we would be notified. This happened once in the history of the Near-Death Experience Foundation. The plagiarized NDE was not shared on the Near-Death Experience Foundation survey but in an interview, which we no longer do. 6. My background as a physician helps me identify NDEs that describe medical events that seem implausible. 7. It is rare that experiences are submitted as a joke on the Near-Death Experience Foundation survey and they can be easily identified. Years ago, there were two NDEs shared sequentially that described, among other fanciful things, encountering Pamela Anderson in their experiences. These are recognized as joke accounts when submitted to the Near Death Experience Foundation as quickly as they would be recognized as joke accounts that are shared personally. Such Joke submissions to the Near-Death Experience Foundation average about one every few years. 8. My experience in reviewing nearly 4,000 NDEs and about 10,000 experiences of all types helps me recognize which experiences may be falsified. In my experience, the experiences at higher risk of being falsified are those where the contributors have a financial incentive in their experience. This includes those who have written books about their experiences. It also includes those whose vocation, such as channelers or alternative medical healers, may benefit in gaining credibility in the view of their clients if they had a particular experience, especially an NDE. Finally, a rare falsified NDE that slips through the filters does no real harm unless it changes our understanding of NDEs as a whole. It is almost inconceivable that enough falsified NDEs would be shared that we would end up with a false understanding of NDE. After all, what is real is consistently observed. The God study found that in near-death experiences, the concept of God includes the following elements. God loves us unconditionally for who we are. These experiences are often associated with overwhelming, unearthly feelings of love and a magnificent otherworldly light that can vary in appearance. Near-death experiences often become aware of a profound sense of connection and oneness with God and all things. God is described as being beyond human description, not judgmental or condemning, generally not angry or wrathful, and does not communicate a requirement for worship. Additionally, God generally does not give specific commandments about what near-death experiences should do in their earthly lives. Nor does God specify any earthly religion as the chosen religion or the one true religion. 
there is a sense that all religions may be paths toward the same destination. In the view of many people, the existence of an afterlife implies the existence of God. At the Near Death Experience Research Foundation, Dr. Jeffrey Long studied the stories of thousands of individuals who have journeyed to the afterlife. Over 200 near-death experiences describe encounters with God during these close brushes with death. These individuals come from all walks of life, including physicians, scientists, and people from around the world. Remarkably, regardless of their prior cultural or religious beliefs, there is exceptional consistency in their descriptions of God. The evidence from near-death experiences suggests that God loves us all. Near-death experiences accounts repeatedly share that God loves everyone for who they are and what they are, regardless of their religious belief. Lack of religious belief, age, gender, sexual preference, social status, education, or location in the world. These insights occurred while people were generally unconscious or clinically dead. The consistency of what was observed at a time when there was no possibility of a conscious memory is strong evidence that these insights are real. Just the knowledge that we are loved by a God and that there is an afterlife should, in and of itself, be sufficient to help us in our earthly journey in some significant way. Such awareness would empower us to make decisions based more on love than fear. This concept of awareness, if widely known and believed, could change the world. This is one of the most practical uses of this type of spiritual awareness. What evidence is there that God in NDEs is not caused by pre-existing or cultural beliefs? Atheists encounter God in their NDEs even though they have no belief in God. The religious background of near-death experiences at the time of their NDEs does not seem to affect the probability that they will encounter God. Near-death experiences that encounter God have a dramatic increase in their belief in the reality of God, with almost all accepting that God is definitely real after their NDEs. For these near-death experiences, seeing God seems to mean believing in God. What is described about God in NDEs is so consistent that it fulfills a basic scientific principle. What is real is consistently observed. Now I will share four exceptional experiences from the Near Death Experience Foundation website. The following are only excerpts of the full experiences. To read their entire accounts, you can visit the website using the link in the description. First we have Will S. N. D. E. 9986. Off to my left, I saw a light in the distance. At first it appeared to be moving slowly towards me. Then I was suddenly being drawn towards it. In an instant, it was fairly close to me and began to intensely glow, like burning magnesium, only ten times brighter. The light had gorgeous golden, almost yellow tendrils swirling around it. The color at its core was pure white, as the light hovered in front of me, I could hear a high-pitched ringing sound. I experienced the most profoundly overwhelming, astonishing, and indescribable feelings of unconditional love, peace, joy, understanding, and acceptance. This exceptional NDE was due to an allergic reaction to anesthetic, shared about seven weeks after the NDE occurred. Secondly, we have John BNDE. 9982. Only one question was answered. What do prayers feel like? At that moment, the answer came in the form of a massive jolt. I instantly felt every single person's prayer that was thinking of me, their loved ones, the family they had lost, everything. I felt every single thought. There are no real words to describe what that felt like because it was such an overwhelming feeling of unconditional love and peace. As soon as the feeling had hit me, it was gone just as fast, but that single moment felt like an eternity. Once the feeling was gone, I remember thinking, okay, I'm ready to go back. This exceptional NDE was due to a heart attack, shared five days after the NDE occurred. Thirdly, we have Jonathan S. N. D. E. 
9980. My life review did not focus on how many F-bombs I dropped, how many women I slept with, how much I drank, my abandonment of religion, porn, money, nonsense, or how I might have acted like a child. It didn't focus on really much of what we refer to as bad behavior here on Earth. What it focused on, in my case, was interactions with people. We looked at whether I used my gifts and talents to help people and how I made them feel during those interactions. I was shown how we are all connected, everywhere, everyone, everything, and how we are meant to be helping each other progress through our human existences. I was shown that our human lives are a collective movement, not an individual achievement. This exceptional NDE was due to undiagnosed severe sepsis. And lastly we have Thomas S. NDE, 9974. I moved forward in the tunnel, losing my ego and merging with others. I was okay with that, because it was like coming back to my true home. I got so much information, and I got answers and views as well as feelings of all people involved. All I had to do was think about it, and I would get a telepathic answer. I understood that it is impossible to remember everything. So I asked one question, what is the purpose of my life? I heard loving laughter and got the answer, do whatever you like, just do not hurt others. That is it so simple. Then I understood even though I was part of another being, that it is not my time. Immediately I was falling back into myself. I remember this feeling of entering myself. It was quite a physical feeling as I merged with myself and I was very scared of what happened. I still cannot forget about it. I remember everything, and it does not change during all those years. On top of that, it made me less materialistic, more empathic, and there were other strange paranormal experiences that happened afterward. Exceptional STE that is NDE-like with significant spiritual information in conclusion, Dr. Sam Pania's research sheds light on the profound and often overlooked phenomena of death and consciousness. His findings, along with those of other researchers like Dr. Jeffrey Long, challenge conventional scientific views and suggest that consciousness may be more than just a byproduct of brain activity. The experiences shared by individuals who have undergone near-death experiences or returned from death provide compelling evidence of a universal and consistent phenomenon that transcends cultural and religious boundaries. As we continue to explore the mysteries of consciousness and its existence beyond death, it is crucial to remain open-minded and consider these extraordinary accounts with the seriousness they deserve. These insights not only deepen our understanding of human consciousness, but also offer a sense of hope and connection reminding us that love, empathy, and a shared human experience are at the core of our existence. Thank you for joining me on this journey into the exploration of consciousness beyond death. If you found this video informative, please like, share, and subscribe for more content on this fascinating topic. This channel is not monetized, but rather a vocation. Stay curious and let's continue to explore the mysteries of the mind and the universe together.